Friday, May 25th, 1979, the end of that month again, I still go faster than ever, this is tape number 390 and it's side one. Most of this tape I'll be dealing with the Dan White trial in San Francisco, the verdict of the jury and the consequences of that trial, but there are a few things I just want to get into for a moment before I do that. One of the subscribers to these tapes sent me an article from the Philadelphia Inquirer. The date is May the 20th, 1979. Space awaiting colonists. And it tells about the psychological problems they'll have with children when we get to these space colonies and that 200 industrialists and diplomats and physicists and social scientists met at Princeton University on the subject of constructing these space stations within the next 15 years. And, of course, you know, I've done the tapes on Alternative 3, the book that says they're already built and the people are being shipped up there to these space stations for the purposes of genocide, for eliminating 93% of the population on planet Earth. Uh, this article, as I say, is about whole families who will live in space and the problem that the anthropologists will have the psychic effect of living away from Earth. I will go back to... Uh, that subject may be next week or the week after, Alternative 3. But any articles you have, uh, copy them and send them to me. And I think once your consciousness is aware that this project is taking place, if you can entertain the possibility that it is being used not to protect us but for genocide, perhaps some combined effort against the space agencies could be made. I don't know if it can be stopped. But uh, there are people that are catching on to these colonies, and I do appreciate getting articles such as this. I'm glad to see that you're picking them up in your newspapers. Uh, this was a hard week in terms of elections, international elections. It was just about two weeks ago that Margaret Thatcher was elected in Great Britain as a prime minister. They came right on top of the scandals that an $83 million espionage clandestine fund from South Africa was sending money to Great Britain for her election. The man who blew the whistle on that has disappeared. The source of the money is not uh, allocated or designated. It's the sum was a large amount of millions, and they mentioned specifically Margaret Thatcher, and then right after that her top aide was murdered, and then she became the prime minister. Maybe he was the middleman or the recipient for the money, and that's why he had to be murdered. This happens very often. And, of course, she's ready now to recognize Rhodesia and South Africa and the races who put her into office. In Canada, Prime Minister Trudeau is out. He's been replaced by Joe Clark. Uh, there isn't much known about him except the fact that he is a conservative. And, of course, Margaret Trudeau, the Prime Minister's wife, didn't do him any favors. She waited until election time to come out with books about her drug experiences and their sex life and being photographed in bed with other men making movies and running around Club 54, mafia and drug-controlled nightclub in New York, and uh, living it up and trying to embarrass the prime minister at a time when I imagine a little peace and family tranquility might have helped the image. We are an image-oriented society, so she did everything to sabotage Prime Minister Trudeau. And then in Germany, Karl Karstens, an ex-Nazi, uh, ran in the Christian Democratic Party, the new president of Germany. But both candidates in this case were ex-Nazis. He says he was forced to join the Nazi party. But an ex-Nazi is like an ex-CIA man, and let's see what he does about the statutes of limitations running off in December 79. Or will he be meeting with his old, old Nazi cohorts when they come out from the woodwork? If you have letters to write now, write them to Carl Karstens, 
at the Christian Democratic Party if you want the statute not to run out and the fact that old Nazis could still be prosecuted for war crimes. In the United States, Bert Lance and Jimmy Carter's uh, campaign combine is being broken into. Jack Anderson is helping it by making constant references to money from Robert Besco. And Jimmy Carter's ship is sinking, and he's being discredited, given the uh, deep six politically through the banking scandals in Georgia. Not that he doesn't deserve them if they were corrupt, but there are other corrupt people that do not get investigated, and they never go into such things as Dorothy Hunt plane crash or Martha Mitchell's kidnapping and injection or the death of Congressman William Mills or J. Edgar Hoover. And many, many deaths that are outright murders are left unturned. But sabotaging Jimmy Carter through the banking is a good way to lower his image. And, of course, it will help the same conservatives who won in Canada, Great Britain, and Germany. Now, one a brief mention about a subject that I've talked about in regards to the Howard Hughes affair. Uh, there's an aide for Howard Hughes named Johnny Meyer. He had two Meyers, M-E-I-R is the one I'm referring to now, the other John Meyer that worked for Howard Hughes, M-E-Y-E-R, went on to work for um, Aristotle Onassis and Jackie Onassis, public relations Meyer. This John Meyer set up the computer uh, department for the youth organization, was active in their political um, activities, knew much about the youth organization for 10 years, and he left to go to Canada. He's been charged by the Summa Corporation, the youth organization, for selling fraudulent land and mineral claims in Nevada and in the Southwest that were worth millions of dollars, and the IRS has been on his tail for a long time, and he has taken refuge up in Vancouver, British Columbia. On a tape, it's tape number 314, March 26, 1978, I did a tape about Howard Hughes and Johnny Myers and about his conflict with the Hughes organization and I talked about some papers that were found in the hotel room where a man, I, they call him Howard Hughes, I believe it was Vance Cooper, died. And there were a large number of papers found in the room that weren't uh, burnt or destroyed, about 1,400 pages. And these pages were copied by the Canadian government. They had a set that they gave Johnny Meyer and Doug Wallace, an attorney uh, from, Vancouver, from Washington, Bellingham, Washington, I believe, uh, went up to Vancouver to get these papers from Johnny Meyer, who wanted me to have them and to analyze them. They were in the possessions of the employees of Howard Hughes at the time he died or at the time the double died. So Doug Wallace brought me these papers, and I did a, a tape on it. He was on the uh, tape show with me at KLRB at the time. I was still on the air there. And December the 4th, 1977, we did a tape, number 398, and March the 5th, 1978, I did some more interview with Doug Wallace on those particular tapes, 398, 311, and 314. Well, Johnny Meyer has been brought from Vancouver to Utah uh, and being charged with forging, and the charge is brought that the documents that he had from the Howard Hughes Hotel in Mexico City did not include a section that referred to a Judge Anderson. There were six papers or so among the 1,800 pages that referred to Judge Anderson in Utah, who was to be in charge of the accusations that Johnny Meyer had swindled the Hughes people for mining swindles, taking money for land that had no minerals, and Judge Anderson was to be the judge. And Myers came up with these papers that Judge Anderson was in the pocket of the Mormon church, that they had paid him off. And then Myers claimed he couldn't get a fair trial in Utah because, according to these documents, Judge Anderson was in the control of the Mormon church. Doug Wallace took that information and wrote to the FBI and the Justice Department and wanted the judge disbarred. And now it seems that the documents on Judge Anderson were forged documents. He's being charged for forgery. And as I say, I mentioned them on tape number 314, March 26, 1978. And this is, I think, important for me to bring to your attention for those of you who have all the back tapes or who may be ordering in the back. I've done 15 years of research. I've written many articles. I've done many 
radio programs and many tape cassettes, but this is the first time, to my knowledge, to my knowledge, than any information that was given to me specifically that I passed along to any listeners seems to be not correct. I may be wrong on other information, but I haven't been corrected yet. If my research was wrong in the past or up to the present day, and it's possible it was, but as of yet, I do not know of any incidents where I have been wrong or had to backtrack. I get a lot of information. I was the first person in the United States to get the gemstone file from Bruce Roberts. I was one of the first in 1970 to receive the Torbett document, that unpublished manuscript from the Southwest. I get information every week. I got some from a prisoner this week who was in uh, Vacaville with Donald DeFries. Letters and manuscripts come to me, and I'm pretty careful to filter out what I think is provable is true and what isn't. And to the best of my knowledge, uh, I've done a pretty good filtering process considering how much has come to me. But these six pages that were included with the 1,800 other pages were forged. They're, at least Johnny Myers saying they're forged, and he's, he's being charged with forgery. And he's the defendant, and they claim that he forged these and threw them in with the others to smear Judge Anderson. Right now, Johnny Meyer is in jail in Utah. If you don't take the Deseret News or the Salt Lake Tribune, you don't know any of this that's going on. He's held with a no bail. Uh, Doug Wallace has taken the powder. He can't be located. He's the one who brought the forged documents down to me, and Judge Anderson is pushing the case. So as far as tape 314, March 26, 1978, I did a story on Judge Anderson, the memos about him in the Howard Hughes um, suite penthouse in Mexico that were given to the Canadian government, and it seems that in addition to the original papers, those were forged. I am sorry about that. It may be that at the trial, Johnny Meyer can prove that they weren't forged and that he's innocent, and then I wouldn't have to backtrack what I'm saying. But right now, there's a prosecution case, and they feel that these were planted by him in order to get Jack An Judge Anderson off the case. Now to the San Francisco scene. It's still too recent for me to be coolly objective to what is going on up there. I'm very angry. If I didn't have an appointment... Uh, this week I would have been up in San Francisco on the streets, I believe, demonstrating, and I came as close to throwing things as I ever felt, but I still have my emotions intact, and I'm fighting with the pen and the microphone for whatever it's worth. But in that very fine book that I quote over and over again called Inspection for Disarmament, edited by Seymour Melman, he tells about arming Germany for World War II, and we are really arming the United States for World War III. And he refers E.J. Gumbel in this book to the role of the law courts in Germany as they were getting ready for the war and the takeover of the uh, Third Reich of the German government. He said the role of the law courts is important. And as I say, I've quoted this many, many times, and it applies to the San Francisco courts and Dan White. It says the political assassinations committed by members of the secret armies put a heavy burden on the administration of justice. Murderers had to be acquitted. The victims had to be shown as guilty. This task was fulfilled by the employment of military courts that sided with military men when they were accused of murder, by the slowness of the justice-enforcing agencies and their inability to find the guilty or to locate them. And they would accept at face value information or claims about the accused murderer and the very victim that they hit became responsible for his own death. There was a perversion of the courts and illegal activities that took place in the courts from the Supreme Court on down. And uh, this book tells how in order to get away with at least 400 political murders before Adolf Hitler came to power, the, one of the things they had to do was to pervert the law courts, the Supreme Court, the police, and the army where the guilty got off the innocent were locked up, and the victims became responsible for their own death. From the moment that Har Supervisor Harvey Milk and Mayor George Moscone were murdered, from the moment they were murdered, the purpose was to protect the former policemen, firemen, 
the program killer, and everybody in San Francisco and law enforcement played a role in that. Diane Feinstein, a member of the Board of Supervisors, now Mayor of San Francisco, got on national television and said that poor Dan White was such a good man, but he had just had a new baby, his wife had a new baby, and he opened a potato stand at Pier 39, a new fancy shopping development in San Francisco, and had a lot of money problems because his wife was taking care of the baby and not working, and that drove him to do this cold-blooded murder. Uh, as I mentioned last week on the tape, th- tape 388, rather, two weeks ago, the entire defense of Dan White was going to be that he was too good for San Francisco, that San Francisco was corrupt, that he was filled with social responsibility, he had strong ideals, the city was immoral, uh, he wouldn't step on your toe, he couldn't hit a fly, he was too weak, he lived by the golden rule, he had a code of honor, and that was the way the trial was going two weeks ago, and that's the way the jury went for it. In addition to that, the way the jury was selected uh, was completely off base. We say in a jury trial a person should have a jury of his peers, but that doesn't mean that a white policeman has a jury of military people and former policemen or people associated with the police department. The prosecution, and we'll go into that, allowed this jury without any questioning. The jury was chosen in minutes. One of the jurors, his name is Richard Aparicio, He was a former San Francisco police officer, so you would know where his interests are. He said in the press afterwards, the jurors did a tremendous job. We took into account expert testimony. They took testimony about four psychiatrists and one psychologist who became the experts who never saw Dan White until months, two months after the murders took place. They used no experts from the Army when White was in the Army, no experts from uh, when he was in the police department or psychologists or psychiatrists, but they chose hand-select a barrage of experts with two- and three-hour visits that became the experts on Dan White's state of, state of mind, while he didn't even testify at all. Another juror was Mrs. Barbara Costoris, whose husband is a chef at San Francisco Jail at City Hall, and uh, she said there was no question about policemen not liking homosexuality. There was no political implications. You know, she thought the jury was fine and they did a good job. Uh, One was a former police officer. The other was uh, married to a man who still works at the City Hall Jail. Another juror was Nelson Bermudez, who does work for the Bank of America. He's a printer for Bank of America. When they say printer for Bank of America, I'm not sure who they mean. Um, I just got some blank checks from Bank of America. They're printed by Linton Industries, which is a conduit of the CIA to overthrow Greece. So uh, does Linton hire Bermudas? They don't say, but he works for the Bank of America and said that, uh, as they understood it, Dan White couldn't show malice towards uh, the mayor and the supervisor because this is, in quotes, from the newspaper, malice, according to the instructions, shows breaking the law in spite of an awareness that the act is illegal, doing it for a base and antisocial purpose, and with a wanton disregard for life. Now, Dan White went to a drawer in his home and filled his pocket with bullets, which are dum-dum bullets, which is a disregard for law, breaking the law because they are illegal and they're flat-edged and they cause death, these dum-dum bullets. He climbed through a window in the city hall when people went through the desk where there were screening devices, which is not illegal to go through the window, but the purpose was to avoid detection of a weapon, and a weapon was what he was carrying. He went to the mayor's office and shot him in the body, and when the mayor fell down, he went right to his head with uh, three or four dumb, dumb bullets and blew his head is practically off, right assassination style, right into the head. He walked out of that office and didn't have silencers on the gun and nobody went after him and went down the hall and spoke to Diane Feinstein, the supervisor, went into Harvey Milk's office and one and a half minutes later he had reloaded his gun that he emptied out on um the mayor and wasn't sure he'd have enough bullets, put in more dum-dum bullets, 
shot four in the head of Harvey Milk. He went up to his former aide and asked for the keys to her car and went to the doggy diner down the street on Van Ness, which was just blocks from the city hall. By then, the mayor had called the chief of police and said that Dan White had walked out of Harvey Milk's office and was dead. Chief of police Charles Gaines told her that the mayor was also dead, that he knew that. Chief of police Gaines, who I've said should not be chief of police in San Francisco, he is linked to all of the military counterintelligence COINTEL program in Oakland before he moved to San Francisco. Chief of police Gaines did not call a cop to go to the doggy diner to pick up Dan White. They knew the car, the license, the model, because the woman who owned it had given him the keys, and she was standing in the building where two people had an assassination, a mafia-type hit right to the heads. She gave him the key. He went there. He telephoned his wife. No police car pulled up and took him in handcuffs in jail. There was never a photograph of Dan White as a criminal. That's where the cover-up began. He went to the phone and called his wife. He met his wife and walked hand in hand down the street as if nothing had happened. They went into the church where they got this religious Christian cover showing up in church. Then he goes to the police station and turns in his gun very heroically and gave himself up. And the men in the police department began to wear free Dan White T-shirts under their uniforms. A telephone was put in his cell. He had 20 or 30 visitors. And that was what happened to Dan White. The cover-up began by the police department not circling the building and finding out how he got out and yelling and chasing after him. It began when they knew he was the killer and let him go to the restaurant or meet his wife, Pier 39, incidentally, from City Hall. It's quite a long distance, midday traffic. Uh, it's a long distance for them to meet. They didn't tear into the church or outside or on the street. He was never photographed or seen as a criminal at any time with handcuffs or police around him. He had total isolation. Another member of the jury worked for Bechtel Corporation, which uh, you go to your library and look up Bechtel if you want the biography. It's a large CIA front. Uh, Mother Jones had an article about it in their magazine. It's like ITT or Intertel or the USUMA organization. It has large computers and dossiers and instant information on people. It's building up Saudi Arabia, strong political communication systems. One of the jury members, the foreman, works at Bechtel. Another worked at the Army Presidio and the military. And I believe one worked for the phone company. As they said in the newspaper this week, the jury wanted a white, Christian, middle-class law enforcement body. But it was up to the prosecutor to have blacks or gays or minorities of some kind because uh, Moscone was considered liberal in San Francisco and Harvey Milk represented an area of minorities and poor and the homosexual community. But the prosecution allowed a hand-selected jury from the Army, from the police department, a former policeman, a woman whose husband cooked for the police department, a Bechtel Associates, the prosecution help the defense by admitting anything the defense wanted, and they had a hand-picked jury to make sure that Dan White got a manslaughter charge. Article in the paper this week, a loophole makes probation for Dan White possible. Under California Penal Code, it is technically possible that Dan White can escape incarceration altogether. Under Section 1203D, it, in this unusual case where justice would be best served, probation can be granted, even when there was the use of a deadly weapon upon a human being. The court has to decide on the special circumstances, but the, the law, use a gun, go to prison, which is now on appeal, would not apply to white situation. In effect, the, stat, the effect of the statute is to preclude probation where it might otherwise be granted if the person was armed during the commission of a crime. Robbery, kidnapping, rape, and burglary are listed crimes that would require you go to jail, prison, if you use a gun. But manslaughter is not included. Can you believe that one? Since Watergate was white-collar crimes, uh, people call the bleeding liberals the ones that are easing up the laws. But it's the other way around. Now that their own are going to jail, they're writing the laws easier. So you can rob, you can kidnap, 
rape and burglarize. If you have a gun, you go to prison. Manslaughter, kill two people, kill one, reload, kill another. You don't have to go to prison. You can be on probation. Now, that is what Seymour Melman warned about. If you study what happened in Germany, the killers were needed, and they were used over and over again. Then they ran the Gestapo and the Secret Service there in Germany. That is what he means by perverting the court of law. If manslaughter, you're off. Call it murder for the poor, manslaughter for the rich, and you twist the court around so that the man who killed two political people is home free. Uh, November the 1st, Representative Leo Ryan was going to Guyana. As I mentioned on several other tapes, there was the contingency to kill everybody if he went down there. But that's an important date. December the 1st, 1978, Leo Ryan sent Jim Jones a telegram that he was going to visit Jonestown. He had a friend, Associated Press photographer Sammy Houston, whose son, Robert Houston, was murdered by Jones' followers when he defected. He also had a nephew, Leo Ryan, who disappeared after he got linked up with the Scientologist. So Ryan had personal reasons for going in. On November the 1st, he had made the decision, I am going down to Jonestown. And there was this contingency that I mentioned on many tapes earlier and last week, a contingency to kill Leo Ryan if he went down to Jonestown and killed the other people. Now, November the 1st, 1978, the same day that Leo Ryan sent a message that he was going to see Jim Jones, and don't forget the offices for the People's Temple were in San Francisco. That same day, Dan White, who was on the Board of Supervisors, resigned from the Board of Supervisors. November the 1st, Ryan says, I'm going to Guyana, and November the 1st, Dan White resigns from the Board of Supervisors, which will later be the motive for murdering George Moscone. In San Francisco, George Moscone, the mayor, U.S. Attorney Hunter, D.A. Joseph Freitas were all involved with Jonestown. It was a depot for shipping people out. Guns, drugs, and cash were sent from there. Welfare recipients were sent down and their passports were taken away and they were drugged and poisoned and um, humiliated. Juveniles were sent for experimentation. It was a cover for training assassins. They obtained signed confessions for assassinations. The entire San Francisco political structure was involved. And the day that Leo Ryan had said, I am coming down, was the day that Jim, Dan White resigned from the Board of Supervisors. And as I said before, Moscone would have to be killed. Like Leo Ryan, there was a contingency. Uh, he's similar to the people who knew too much about Watergate or in the John Kennedy assassination, people like William Harvey and Sheffield Edwards and Donald Donaldson and George DeMorenchil, Gary Powers, John Rosselli, Sam Giacana. He was important. Moscone was important, like Donaldson, DeMorenchil, uh, William Sullivan. And if Ryan went down and if the Jonestown truth came out, Moscone had to be killed. Dan White was a program killer from his Vietnam police fire department days, and he was to be used as a killer to protect the police department's involvement in Jonestown. I believe that. I don't believe he expected to go back to be on the Board of Supervisors. I believe he was a selected patsy, and even though they described him in the court as a robot and a zombie, and the word robot was in the papers again this week, which I think is interesting because robots do not create themselves. They are created by other masters. And when Dan White walked in, turned in his tape, and made a confession statement, November 27, 1979, after the killings, he surrendered, and he, this is what he said. Some of the people have charged me with taking money from big corporations and not recording it, but I never did that. They were going to use me as a scapegoat. Whether or not I was a good supervisor was not the point. This was a political opportunity, and they were going to degradate me and my family and more or less hang me out to dry. Now, that's his political statement. And the point is that the prosecution had to go slow because he knows who they were. He knows who the corporations are. He knows who bought the Porsche, the Mercedes, the home, the financing for Dan White, the trips to Ireland, the honeymoon, five-week honeymoon to Ireland. Ireland, he knows where he's been, and even though he can't 
possess himself to stop the killings. And he's programmed to do it. I'm sure he had the guarantee, and all he had to do was say, this city is corrupt, you're all foul, and I will not hang out to dry, which was what he said on his Tate confession. And that was played uh, for the courts when they began their hearing, that he would be the scapegoat. And this was part of his confession that people in San Francisco wanted to use him as part of a political opportunity. As I say, on March uh, November 27, 1978, uh, Mayor George Moscone was killed. Supervisor Harvey Milk was killed. White walks out. He hadn't used a silencer. He wasn't stopped. Nobody yelled or grabbed him. Uh, Harvey Milk was murdered after he walked out of there. No one stopped him. No one followed him. No one went to the doggy diner or the church or on the streets. No police car went after him. How long do you think it would take to find another person who killed two public officials in a building when they walk out and get in a car and drive away and park three or four blocks away to make a telephone call? How long do you think it would take the police to find that car? Why didn't they find Dan White? On the other side of this tape, we'll do some more about this because this is symptom. To, it's a symptom of the sickness of the mentality of the psychiatrists and the courts in San Francisco. And what goes in San Francisco will hit your towns sooner or later if it isn't there already. From the moment that Dan White walked out of that jail, he was in control. When he made the confession, he was charging them. He was talking about corporations. He was talking about being a scapegoat. And he talked about them letting him hang out to dry. Dan White was warning the San Francisco politicians that he did a job for them and they better leave him alone. He went up to his cell. 30 or 40 guys were just about congratulating him. He put his head back on the pillow. He had lots of visitors the first day and he simply watched the ball games and the constant talk shows in San Francisco about Jim Jones and the Iranian students and so forth kept out of the subject of the mind control of Dan White and the fact that they described his trance-like state being a zombie and not showing any emotions for the kinds of murders that he had done. He knew right off the bat that they would give him the kind of trial that they gave in Nazi Germany and that he would be out very shortly without having to hassle with the law enforcement for these murders that they considered uh, he was doing a favor for them. This week, uh, the newspapers were filled out here with the story of the prosecution being weak and not prosecuting Dan White. Thereafter, Joe Freitas, they say his political career may be over because uh, people are angry. They don't say that he should be investigated for the illegal voter frauds or the links to Jonestown and the juveniles and the welfare recipients that were sent down there. They say his political career is threatened because of the weak prosecution. But for those of you who've been taking my tapes and following the research I do out here, we've known that Freitas couldn't possibly prosecute Dan White. They allowed him to appear as Mr. Kling in San Francisco, the man in the midst of corruption. And you see, part of that is true. San Francisco politics is so corrupt. And they brought in Chief of Police Gaines from Oakland, who worked with counterintelligence with the CIA and the Pentagon, who harassed the Black Panthers and caused all the violence and killings and the prison confinement of people like Bobby Seale and Huey Newton and Eldridge Cleaver and uh, the murders of Jonathan Jackson and George Jackson. This was very much part of the Gaines Oakland uh, criminal investigation group, the tax squads of Evelyn Younger, the California violences. Then he left Oakland, had a two years disappearance where he probably went to the war college and for further training because he became chief of police in San Francisco. And we have the notorious Zodiac killings where David Tashi of the San Francisco police was impersonating the Zodiac killer and writing letters to himself or to the city. And you had the SLA and the zebra killings and the looking for black people and practically having identification cards to be on the streets. And the Donald DeFries, there are Wheeler escapades where they weren't looking for Wheeler who had walked out of Vacaville and provided money for DeFries. Uh, Charles Gaines has been a bloodbath. I could see it coming the minute he was appointed in San Francisco. Why San Francisco would want him after he did such a bad job in Oakland, 
I really can't understand. San Francisco used to be a great city, and it combines all the elements of the Japanese community, the Italians, the, the Chinatown, the minorities there blended in, and the hippies and the, the blacks, and it was a very liberal, beautiful city. Just like our minds could be open and clear until the CIA came with their poisonous drugs and chemicals and began to alter people's personalities and turn them into violent zombies. So Gaines went to San Francisco, and it was in the San Francisco Police Department that Dan White had all of his buddies because he was a former policeman. And the entire trial, as I say, was for Dan White. Uh, Newspapers had articles this week that the jury was crying for Dan White for the moment. Uh, They saw him. They played a tape about him, and they heard about his bravery and how normal he was and how he uh, worked so well on his job and everybody loved him. And they actually physically cried for Dan White, even though he was one of the hardest stone-ass killers that they'll ever meet in their lifetime. These people's sympathy was with him because he had killed a homosexual and Moscone, the mayor, George Moscone, the mayor. And George Moscone was number one on the hit list of politicians to be murdered if Jim Jones died. We've talked about that before. But nobody in the district attorney's ask would ask, office would ask why, because Don Freitas, the district attorney, was linked to Jonestown. So nobody asked why. As I say, 16 members of the uh, uh, Jonestown community are represented by the CIA. 100 or 200 are still missing. 110 and 210, whichever figure, uh, it's hard to tell which is accurate, but that many, minimum 110 are still missing. A boat is still missing. People that funded it and sent it up are missing. And the Congress and the State Department admit that killers are out at large, trained killers are out at large, but nobody will look at Dan White and say that he is one of the trained killers and that Moscone had to go or ask why. The San Francisco police wanted Moscone dead. They wanted Milk murdered. They represented the poor, the labor movement, the gays, the lesbians, Indians, blacks, minorities, you name it. And uh, the people, the underdogs in the Bay Area felt comfortable with these two people, and they were both killed the same day. The psychiatrists that come in on these cases are the worst type of people. They remind me of the psychiatric studies of Nazi Germany, uh, the bleeding hearts, and uh, they say that uh, Dan White was mentally sick for 23 years, one of them said. Uh, Dan White went to George Moscone if he could have had the job back. If the answer was yes, White would have been normal the rest of his life, maybe. If he had said no, then Dan White was sick. But the point is that the yes and no, I don't think really had anything to do with the reason Uh, George Moscone was murdered any more than the way William Sullivan smiles or Donald Donaldson talks or looks. I think they're murdered because they know too much. And uh, the way that the case is run, the prosecution, it indicates that they absolutely don't want to get into anything political, and the district attorney stated that. Uh, Nobody's ever asked in this case about the money that Dan White had, about the cars, the Porsche, the Mercedes, the home, the furnishings, the trips to Ireland, several trips. Nobody would even think to look up his tax records, his income tax and his declared tax to see if his spending exceeded his income. And if it did, who put up the difference? Uh, His wife was a teacher in Germany and Japan. I got a call from somebody this week that she also taught at a Philippines Army base. That somebody was with her in Germany and in the Philippines in the Army base and that uh, she could be trained in mind control, which was what I felt all along. She has the military connections, which put Dan White, uh, by the Harvey Oswald, between Marina and Jean de Mornschild. He was between his aide, former aide, this Miss Apcar, and his, whose car he used to get away, and also his wife, who had the military experience. And, of course, there's no discussion of where he met her or went. Now, there's been other weak prosecutions. Some of them, uh, I think, over the Watergate, the Maurice Stans, John Mitchell prosecution of the Security Exchange Commission, the money that was supposed to be transferred, the BESCO money, to these men for election campaigning. Uh, Both men got off. But what prosecutor in New York City is going to prosecute the former Secretary of the Treasury or the former Attorney General? And John Connolly had a weak prosecution in the Milk Fund down in Texas, 
and his name was mentioned in stopping the Patman investigation of money to Watergate. John Conley and Gerald Ford were mentioned, but when their own co-workers and buddies are doing the prosecution, if they don't present hard evidence, then the jury can't do anything but uh, acquit them because the prosecution is weak. There was a jailer at the San Francisco jail by the name of James Denman. He wasn't called as a witness. He was with White after he turned himself in. He left and resigned from the jail recently because he couldn't get along with the administration there and was criticizing it. Um, he said White was receptive. He was, got a reception not inconsistent with that of a hero when he went into the police department, that District Attorney Joe Freitas wouldn't use Denman as a trial witness, that the police and White were fraternal, that they smiled and gave him pats on the back, they were laughing and chummy, and that he was very purposeful and deliberate, and the court tried to show Dan White as a man of emotions who cried because of what he had done, and Denman says this isn't true at all. There was no shame, no guilt, no tears. He didn't show any emotion, and only one tear. He called his mother, Hi, Mom, how are you doing? I guess you heard. And that was the only time he said he never noticed a quiver. He was businesslike. He was controlled. He was super cool after the murders. And his attitude against liberals and gays was open. He hated them. And it was never brought out at the trial how much he disliked these people. Uh, Joe Freitas said he didn't want to deal with this. The district attorney decided that he didn't want to deal with political implications. Joe Freitas said he didn't want to call White Jailer James Denman because of, in quotes, political decisions. Uh, this was in the paper this week, and of course that confirms what I've been trying to say to you all along about what went on up there. This is another quotation. The prosecutor didn't want to go into the connection between police attitudes towards gays and liberals and Dan White's state of mind. Freitas called White's attitudes to his victims as irrelevant. That's like a case in the South where, remember, the Ku Klux Klan has a car and goes into a black man, runs over him, and murders him as he's crossing the street and where the car could have gone in another direction, and they can't bring out the fact that a black man was run down at night. They just say it was a car accident. The racism or the hatred has a lot to do with the state of mind of how you kill. This is uh, true when people are in the Army. They get basic training. They're going to Vietnam. They were told about the, the kooks and the goons and how to hate and how to kill. And they would have to indoctrinate them with a certain amount of hatred to make them good killers. And the state of mind of uh, Dan White about his victims, according to the district attorney who also allowed these racist murders down in Vietnam to take place. So you know where D.A. Freitas is, these 913 murders, one quarter of them 16 years of age and younger who isn't investigating that and who is not only not investigating it, but is a part of that racism and slavery and genocide and experimentation. He said it was irrelevant that the person that he's supposed to be prosecuting happened to hate the people that he killed. That wasn't important. Mr. Denman, the jailer, said there's a profound paranoia about gays in the police department and the prosecution, and D.A. Freitas didn't want to deal with this. I don't think he should exclude any subject if there is a motive for killing people that could be exploited by the police department. It should have brought out, been brought out. Now, Dan White didn't speak to Harvey Milk. He hated him. He hated him because there was a youth campus mental health facility in the neighborhood that Dan White had, and White was a racist. He didn't want blacks or poor brought into this area, and, and Milk voted that this particular former school or church be given to a youth campus mental health facility. So Dan White didn't speak to Harvey Milk. They had an intermediary that spoke to them. So when he went in to see him, Diane Feinstein, a supervisor, said, come here and talk to me. He says, no, I want to talk with uh, Harvey Milk. Why would he want to talk to him? He wouldn't talk to him at the Board of Supervisors. He walked in, and a minute and a half later, those bullets, those fatal bullets, right to the head. He was blown away. They had an intense hatred. They had a difference with each other. They didn't have conversations. And yet the prosecution would make you believe that this was manslaughter because when Dan White walked in armed to the teeth and rearmed and loaded again after he killed one person, 
They want you to believe it was because Harvey Milk smirked at the time that Dan White committed manslaughter. It wasn't that he was bringing in mental health cases in the neighborhood, but Harvey Milk was responsible for his own murder because he smirked. We don't know if he smirked. He may have had the same face he always had. And Dan White hated him, so he killed him. And imagine this man may be on the streets. He could have probation and be out tomorrow. And worse than that, they want to send him to a federal prison, one of those Lompoc funny, funny farms where he'll play golf with other hit men and have a ball until he's out. And then they'll send him to Ireland where he always wanted to be and probably pay him off heavily with more fancy cars and say he suffered enough. There's more favoritism to follow. He can be on bail according to the law. He could be on probation according to the law. His two murders don't run consecutively. They run concurrently, which is a seven-year prison term reduced to two and a half to three years if they want. He could have mental testing and be out. So there's no reason for Dan White to even serve more time. It will be up to the judge. Now, what did the San Francisco police do when all this was over? Dan White was one of their boys. Some of the jurors were associated with them. They might have known that there would be a reaction. J. Edgar Hoover knew that there would be a reaction when Martin Luther King was murdered because he was the voice of moderation. Harvey Milk worked with the gay community. Moscone worked with the liberals in the area. And they knew there'd be some reaction. So in order to make sure it was great, jolly, good reaction, J. Edgar Hoover had provocateurs in Los Angeles, in Detroit, and in the South. And as soon as Martin Luther King was killed, instead of blacks going into deep mourning, certain blacks took to the streets and rioted. And later it turned out many were provocateurs. Well, the gay community got out on the streets. They had had a march after Harvey Milk had died. They got out on the streets and started walking to City Hall. And I think they know that the collusion and the crime was there. It was not down at the jail to lynch uh, Dan White. This all was coming from City Hall. And they marched there, and the police were there. And the police stood there for two and a half hours until they gathered. And some people started breaking the doors and the windows and breaking burning cars and burning a computer set there, the damage uh, mileage is a million dollar damage. And the police watched for two hours, watched cars burn. They said they couldn't do anything, but they had tactical squads. They could do plenty. And they became the sympathetic ones. When things were hurled at them, they stood there. Now, Gaines has never been known for restraint. If he can get you, he gets you in the jugular. So in this case, uh, they wanted the gays to be the violent ones and to make them look as if they're the rational ones at a time like this. So they stood there for two and a half hours while stones and things were thrown at them and uh, didn't move and let them beat up and break up and burn and pillage to show the violence of the gay community. And I'm sure they're assisted with provocateurs and they're trying to check that out now. This built up for two hours so that the police officials are simply furious at Charles Gaines. The right wing is furious in that community because he didn't bring in help and didn't stop this damage. And the uh, gay community is furious because he didn't stop in and use restraints. And not only was a million dollars damage, but the reputation to the gay community, just like the demonstrations in Los Angeles of the Iranians made it appear that all Iranian students are off their rockers and uh, not receptive to the rights of others in this country. Then, after that damage was done, the police department got their little cars. And again, this is Gaines' expertise. They went in with a vengeance, and they swept into the gay community like Nazi stormtroopers. They beat up, they tore apart, and it was just like the movie Cabaret uh, or Serpent's Egg, and hell broke loose. And then the street theater began, and Charles Gaines' men began their bloody um, retaliation. Now, the police didn't come in and stop the group when they were meeting, but they went in to retaliate with personal vengeance, which they are not supposed to do any more than those policemen friends of Patty Hearst to go in and beat people up in a gay bar. And as I've said, I've quoted that book, California, The First Parafascist State by Mr. Lamont. You have to realize that what goes on here, as I said at the beginning of tape, is what's going to happen in your own hometowns. This is a microcosm 
of this country and it gets its breeding ground here and then it spreads this place is the window for tomorrow described in that book what they act out here you will get tomorrow the city hall was quiet by 11:30 at night the gay community was quiet and then the cops started coming they went over to castro street which is about a mile or two miles away they went and marked cars first there were two cars then there were three cars, and then there were three people in the back seat, three in the front seat, and one cop leaned out and called a gay a name, a fag, or something like that. That's fighting words. The fire engines came, and the crowds on the street watched because there weren't many people out there. They were in bars and off the streets, and they got out about 18th Street, and tax squad cars came, and there's a man named Inspector Webb who saw the police car coming into what was now quiet area and saying they're going to start a riot. Everything was quiet when they arrived. And then they said, we lost City Hall. We aren't going to lose this one. As I say, the streets were quiet, and they selected a place called the Elephant Walk Bar, which is on Castro Street. They went in to get their revenge. These are people to protect the law. They had riot gear where the people they were to hit were unarmed. They had nightsticks. And for 10 minutes, they duplicated the scenes out of the halls of Nazi Germany. They lost control. They crashed the bar stools. They broke chairs, windows, mowed everything down. One man was on TV last night, broken ribs, broken spleen, jaw cut. And there were about 20 riot police that swept through and broke everything in the place. One customer was sitting in the bar. He wasn't even at City Hall. He had nothing to do with this at all. They hit him on the head, the chin. They split open his chin. He has broken ribs. His lung has collapsed. He's in the hospital. Another man who was hit with clubs across the head, stitches, and they were swinging and hurting. And then they walked out. And they took it upon themselves to beat up people that weren't even out of the building or on the street who had nothing to do with the decisions. And they went in there, and in policemen's uniforms, they started to beat these people up. Now, Dan Wright White sat there like a robot, during the trial, as I say, he was in a trance, and nobody bothered to ask why. Everybody talks about books such as War on the Mind, Operation Mind Control, another book on mind control, Battle for the Mind, the uh, Control of Candy Jones. I could list 20 books on mind control. And there isn't one newspaper person, one author, one psychologist talking about Dan White being a zombie and being program killer, I think as far as as of today, which is May 25th, 1979, I'm the only person that has said on radio and on tapes that he is a program killer. I called people in San Francisco today. They hadn't even thought about that he should be trained to murder. The prosecution in this case did not present evidence of premeditation, even though it was all there. Dan White was a robot. The manslaughter murder was done, according to them, in the heat of passion, which means that no murder anymore is murder. All are manslaughter because nobody is thinking about what they're doing. There's a murder trial today of a man who killed two people at the light company, power and light company, and he said he was whipped by his parents and hit, and the psychologist representing him was the same psychologist at the trial of Dan White. And hardships as a child uh, make you crack when you're older. And instead of killing himself, he killed two people. And the defense is that he snapped as an adult because of things that happened in his past. The family of George Moscone and Harvey Milk weren't brought into it. They wrote it off. We didn't have to bring in the family because he was gay. He had a brother. He has parents. He has cousins, people that care about him. We have families of friends that care. Not one of those people is considered. The jury was picked for their background, as I said, to law enforcement. None of them were challenged. They were all in Dan White's favor, and they justified these murders that they were in emotional turmoil filled with a sense of rage, anger, and betrayal. With that justification, nobody is safe on the streets. Every murder is a justifiable homicide, this situation is the culmination of years of corruption in San Francisco, racism, uh, getting away with murders, kidnappings, hiding the roots of the SLA, the Zodiac Killer. 
it is a terrible situation that won't be solved until they meet very basic questions on who funds these people, who provides the cars, the houses, the trips abroad, who puts up the money, what mental hospitals they've been in, where their mates been. As soon as you answer those questions, you'll find out who is disarranging the natural political climate of this country. But it's the mayor, senators, candidates, supervisors, presidents. They're being killed because the police and the military want it. And the people are so dumb that even if the books come out and the information comes out that suggests that there's collusion or mind control, we sit here like a bunch of sheep and take it. And the only result of all this apathy has to be the escalation of bloodbath. Incidentally, with regards to Dan White, I am against the death penalty. And I believe that these zombies should be studied and uh, deprogrammed, except that it, that's an inconsistency because the law enforcement has put them there in the first place, so they're not going to snitch on each other. There's a case of a man in California prisons now, Edmund Kemper, K-E-M-P-E-R, who was convicted of killing eight people, one of them being his mother. And he was placed in California medical facilities, and there was a big lawsuit a few years back to have a lobotomy done on Kemper. They wanted to remove his brains, and a man named uh, Hunter Brown, a psychosurgeon in California who worked with Evel Younger and Dr. Jolly West, uh, said that he did 300 behavioral operations, and Peter Bragan was against the psychosurgery, as I am, and believes that it shouldn't be done, but it's a good way to get rid of the brains of a person who snaps that the police department have used as a patsy once they're in jail uh, do the psychosurgery on them. Well, Hunter Brown wanted to do psychosurgery, and I saw Edmund Kemper on national television once, and he asked if he could have psychosurgery on his head, let Dr. Brown do that. This Kemper also had said at his trial that the policeman and a Navy man could have stopped him, that they saw him drag a body up to his apartment, and as much as hinted that he was assisted or with collusion that people knew what he was doing and weren't stopping him and he became a mass murderer. As a child he had murdered his grandparents when he was 15 years old so he's really a good subject to work with. So they kept him in a mental hospital and then let him out and uh, to work uh, on the streets. He was in the Santa Cruz area and the court denied him permission to have psychosurgery. He wanted that to alter his brain and let Hunter Brown, who worked with the CIA, do that to him. Uh, he was at Atascadero for five and a half years, and then he was sent out. Well, now Edmund Kemper just got a trophy last April, this last April, in uh, Vacaville Medical Facilities. He's contributed 2,900 hours to making tape recordings of books for the blind, and now they admit that he has an IQ of 130, that he is intelligent, and that uh, he's made 1.75 million feet of tape. He reads 28 hours a week, and he's produced 1.75 million feet of tape, and this program uses volunteer inmates from the California medical facilities. So they've taken this mind that wanted a lobotomy that probably couldn't reason or think or remember afterwards, wanted to do psychosurgery on him, and people like Dr. Peter Bregan were instrumental in stopping it, and I'd written letters and really objected. I objected to this totally, of mutilating the brain with a needle or a knife. And now he's a very useful member of society. I have a friend who's blind, and she may be receiving books that Edmund Kemper is reading. And uh, they're tape recording books on the tape cassettes, and it's a large library for the blind. So the people that have committed crimes can be very useful for society and feel that their life is useful. And... Um, do something you can't make it up to the people he killed but the point is that at the time of this trial he was supposed to have a low iq a person that could be having his head mutilated and he asked for it on television and when they stepped in and said no this is wrong he diverted his life to something useful and that's the way it should be and uh, dr brown had already bragged about doing 300 we saw one of his 300 on television and it was a blubbering idiot a really sick person who couldn't function anymore after the surgery was done but that's one way of getting rid of political pathies using them for particular 
political services of the police department and law enforcement and then mutilate their brains and uh, just leave them going on like a vegetable garden later. I'm glad to see that Kemper is able to do this work. I'm sure he feels good about it. And as I say, last month he got a trophy for the amount of time that he's put into reading books so the blind can hear these books. I want to give you um, on the printed sheet that goes with the tape the address of a group called Campaign for Political Rights. They had a convention this last December. Uh, the purpose is to end covert operation and spying and harassment abroad and overseas. And if you send them some money, they have a 15-page booklet with endless addresses of um, all kinds of movements and uh, sources of documentation in the Senate and uh, important information you have on covert action, Freedom of Information Act, Grand Jury Project, the Michigan Coalition and Government Spying. They have a list of 30 or 40 organizations and cassette recordings. My tapes are listed here along with other tapes on red squads on campus inside the CIA, uh, videotape cassettes, uh, the murder of Fred Hampton, Punishment Park, the Rockford Files, uh, slideshows, posters, and films that are available, and articles, newsletters, the addresses of where to get the newsletters, and a complete list of people trying to stop, I don't know how much good we're doing, the counterintelligence activity. They have literature on surveillance of women, spying on nuclear power opponents, the surveillance of black Americans, terrorism and political surveillance, local and state police spying, uh, harassment. There are addresses, oh, maybe there's two, 300 addresses to write for on CIA and mind control, human drug testing, reports by the U.S. Senate Committee hearings and uh, book on the mind manipulators, uh, memoirs of former employees. It's broken down into all kinds of subjects on repression, intelligence, community, and so forth. Uh, it's silly for me to spend a whole tape on this. I'm sure that for a dollar you can buy all the names of the organizations and the addresses and see how much information is available. So I'm going to pass that along to you and let you send for that material because I think it will interest a lot of you in particular areas that you're interested in. A lot of information here keeps you busy for years to come if you can absorb all of it. One last item, fast, because we don't have much time. I did two tapes in January on John Paisley, the CIA official who was reported to have committed suicide by the Pentagon and the CIA and the FBI. Two life insurance companies this week refused to pay benefits to his widow because they said they believe he's alive and that the body that was identified as John Paisley is not his. He has been missing, and they claim that they can't pay because they don't believe that he's dead. Our time is out again. I'll see you next week. Take care of yourselves, and we have a pile of news to share. The week goes fast, and I'll be back with you next week. This is Mae Brussel in Carmel, California.